Have you ever looked at a piece of art and suddenly a flood of emotions creeps in and you're transported to a memory or you're starting to build these stories in your head about what the piece is about? That is the power of storytelling and art. I'd like to borrow a quote from Steve Jobs when he said that the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. And research shows that telling a story is 22 times more memorable than simply stating the facts. Stories are the things that connect us to one another. And in this week's episode, we are chatting with an award-winning artist, author, and storyteller whose journey is filled with peaks and valleys, stories that would usher you into pursuing your creative passion. From rejection to redirection to finding his niche and the ability to tell stories through colors, shapes, light, and shadows, this is undoubtedly an episode packed with lessons, tips, and techniques to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us as we dive into how to navigate through the nose and carry on with your passion, consistency and persistence, and why you don't need technical skills to draw or paint, a key tip to getting better at drawing, why it's important to learn from the past through art history, and tips and techniques to master storytelling through your art toolkit. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etcherlab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. So I always was interested in storytelling. That's been sort of my through line since childhood. And I was not particularly gifted with drawing or uh, art in general i've never really been very good at it and so for me i always just want to i will and now of course it's in retrospect looking back i can tell that i always wanted to tell stories all the things that i was involved with were around the idea of telling story or communicating story in some way um I enjoyed making art. I loved making art. I was very passionate about it. I loved cartoons and I always wanted to draw cartoons and to make cartoons, but I wasn't very good at it. And so it sort of caught up to me about the age 16 when the best intention people kind of sat me down and told me, listen, we know that you like this thing, but you're you just don't really have what it takes. Like my high school art teacher told me I should quit. She actually pulled me from the art program and was like, I wasn't allowed to take any more art classes because she was like, you, you, she had the best intentions. And I think, you know, you can't, you don't know who's going to go on and like obsess over a thing and, and to the point of, you know, really devoting their life to it. So she had the best intentions, but she told me that I, I just didn't have what it would take to make art that I, I just wasn't gifted in that regard. So, um, I quit, I just took it to heart. And, um, my parents too, were not very thrilled with the prospect of, uh, no, instability. And so yeah, mm -hmm. the idea of pursuing art, um, and also they just themselves didn't know the various avenues that there, the potential avenues, like, you know, that there are jobs in like animation or in whatever else that you could pursue. So for them, it seemed like a pretty narrow, uh, harrowing path. And so I, I quit when I was 16 altogether, but I had up until that point, I would draw comics constantly. I would draw these little stick figure comics and I would draw constantly, just not technically very well. And, uh, I was trying to draw these little comics of these penguin characters in high school. And I was uh, doing stick figure comics because I wanted to tell a story, but I couldn't draw well enough to actually like, you know, communicate a story. Yeah. So, um, so I was disheartened and I just sort of gave up and um, I ended up going to college for publication design for graphic design. And I did not do any art, per se there. And I, even if I did, I mean, I, I guess I could have tried to get into the illustration department, but painting, which I had no interest in at the time at that school, if you were in the painting department, it was much more sort of modern and they weren't really teaching the kind of thing that I would have been interested in. Um, so I pursued graphic design because it seemed sort of creative adjacent and, uh, and it was, and I was happy doing it. And I did it. I worked as a graphic designer for a beer company for, I think five years. And then I just couldn't like, I couldn't 
stop the itch and like the urge to draw and to try. And I, but I wouldn't do it. And I had a friend who was my best friend and kind of, she's a writer. She was like a writing mentor to me. And she got me into graphic novels because I didn't read comics a lot when I was a kid. I loved mm -hmm. cartoons, but I didn't read comics. And she got me into graphic novels. And I and I was in love with them. And I loved the one that she gave me. She gifted me one. And it was because she was like, you know, you talk about drawing and wanting to draw and how you used to love when you drawing when you were a kid all the time, but you don't actually do it. And, mm -hmm. and she was like, why, you know, why not just do it? And I was, and I, I was like, you know, I, I took the advice. I started drawing and, and it was like, it totally blossomed and opened up and then became a sort of obsession where it was all I, uh, thought about and would go to bed thinking about, and it still is, um, it's changed over the years, but, um, about, I started when I was about 26 and I was, uh, I would work as a graphic designer and I would on my lunch break, I had like a little drawer and I would pull out the drawer and I would just draw as many figures as I could, or I would draw whatever I could. And I was collecting books from the library and I would copy, um, people that I liked and art styles that I liked and, and just trying to grow and learn as fast as I could with the intention of becoming an inker someday, drawing with inks. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I went to do like a weekend seminar at this art school in Florida that was doing a, a graphic novel sort of seminar and um, workshop, I guess you call it. And at that workshop, uh, they had this section of like French comics, which I had never been exposed to before. And I, I probably borrowed every single one of them. So every night I would take like 15, as many as I could haul and take it back to the place I was staying. And I would study them. And then I would take them back and get like 15 more through the day. And I was just like obsessed with, um, Cyril Pedroza and Mobius and a bunch of these French artists. And this one guy in particular, Louis Trondheim used watercolor to color his biography comics. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really cool how it was kind of subtle and I thought, well, maybe I'll try to do that, you know, just like color something I'm doing with a little bit of watercolor. So I bought it like a cheap kit and I tried it. And then it was, it felt like, like a fish in water for the first, it just felt right. And I, and then the obsession became painting and, um, and I've never shaken that obsession since. So it's, uh, and then from there, it was just, uh, trying then to translate that into getting work. And, and eventually, um, I came up with a story. Um, I had come up with a number of stories and I had come up with three stories and I sort of threaded them together, which was the idea for my book, Cody. And I pitched it to anyone who I could get two seconds of their time. And I got rejected by every single person. Um, and uh, I, I, I finally, a publisher took a chance on me. And, and even one of the people who rejected it, sent it to someone who sent it to someone who also rejected it, but they knew someone at Jim Henson and, um, they also didn't have any interest in that idea, but they thought, okay, well, you know, you might be able to do some stuff with our kids department stuff. And so I ended up, I wrote stories and painted stories for some Jim Henson property. So that was sort of my way into getting just like a foot in the door yeah. um, until my book Cody came out. And then um, after that, I've just been sort of working on my own thing. And all the while uh, I became obsessed with plein air painting to get better and, and also art history. So the history mm -hmm. of, painting and particularly plein air painting. And, um, my obsession has been studying these painters from the late 1800s, early 1900s and their storytelling tools. And then how I can sort of glean from them, their concepts of composition, color choices, things like that. And then use that in my comics work to better tell stories. Wow. <laughs> I, I would just have to say, wow. Um, just, just, just to break it down. Um, so when you were 16, someone told you that you don't have what it takes to be an artist. Yes. And <laughs> talk about that. I was like, that was so heartbreaking. I mean, for someone, for any kid out there who probably have that someone tell them that, no, you, you absolutely won't be able to reach that goal. There's no way that you'll be, um, someone quote unquote someone someday 
that is just, I don't know how that person managed to say that to you. Um, oh, no, I think they had the best. Is right now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it sometimes, to be totally honest. Uh, but I, I, it's, I, un- unfortunately, I feel like it's this a thing when you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's part of the territory. And I think for me, I came into creating books and creating stories with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, feeling like I had to prove something to these people. Um, but I then subsequently faced a wall of new rejection from people, from the people with the best intention who I think they thought they were helping me and, uh, who, you know, would give me rejection. I had this, um, my first book, I can't, because I would do these in order to learn how to do comics, I would do these mini comics. So just basically kind of folded up paper, mini comics. And Mm -hmm. I was just trying to learn how to tell a story and and do stories with it. And I finally had like, I wrote one that was like a full length comic, so to speak, it was like 30 pages. And like, even then, like, so I, at that point may have been like 28 or so. And I, I, I put everything into this little comic, this little short story. And I took it to a comic shop that I would go to by the dog park, which is now it's closed. But the, um, but even the owner of the comic shop was like, this is a bad, this is a bad idea. <laughs> he, <laughs> he held up my, uh, he, he took me to the wall and he held up my, my little floppy comic next to like the green lantern or whatever. And he was like, look at this and then look at what you do. He's like, yeah. this is never going to be you're never going to be on the shelf. Like it's, you just don't have it. He, he was like, I mean, this with the best, you know, you should, you should consider writing. You shouldn't be drawing things. <laughs> so it's like, I think it's just part of the territory, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but there's just something about when people start with, you know, I, I don't mean to be rude, but, and then they, they, they would sure. <laughs> Like it's some kind of truth and there's probably truth in there. And they, they probably had the best intention, but I I, I think, you know, you know, there are better ways of delivering something to someone that that, that will not result into something that will be scarring or, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think, and they just, you never know who's going to sort of obsess and, and, and keep, you know, trying. (laughs) And, I, I I believe there there was this artist who who joined the podcast that she doesn't believe in talent. She believes right. that and everything, like literally anything, can be learned if you put in the hours, if you put in the effort. And like what you did, I, I heard the word obsession several times as you were as you were sharing your story, and I took it not as a negative, but more of like you were persistent to really hone your craft, your skill. And maybe it could be coming from a position of you want to prove something. But eventually, as I was listening to you, it's really that burning passion and desire for you to create and yeah. make art and to tell stories. So just going back to that time, um, I'm really sorry you had to go through that. Oh, no. I mean, you know, I think I, when I used to feel like I would think sometimes like I, I felt like I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder that I had a part of my process was this sort of fuel I got from, uh, feeling like I had to prove something, but, yeah. um, yeah, over time it sort of became something much more positive. It became much more just becoming in touch and, and, mm-hmm. um, chasing these, uh, heroes of mine. It became more about that kind of thing, like finding these people like Winslow Homer or Joaquin mm-hmm. Soroya that I could just become so immersed in their life and life story and painting practice that, um, that stuff sort of shook off and it didn't, didn't affect me so much, you know, but I also always felt like that was maybe that was something that I, I went through that was unique, that, that drove me to try to be better. But I've talked to artists and it's, it's a very common story. I, a lot of people, I think, run into someone in their life who says mm-hmm. a well-meaning spouse sometimes, or a parent or a teacher, or whoever, yeah. maybe even a workshop instructor who says mm-hmm. something and I don't know, and, and they don't necessarily mean it to be catastrophic. You know, they don't know the effect it could have, uh, the sort of domino effect, but so I don't think it's that uncommon, but, um, but yeah, I do. I agree with that person. I think the art spirit talks a little bit about that, about art being not just necessarily a painting practice, but they could be, you can be an artist at 
at most anything. And it's just a matter of this, like developing your passion and skill. I'm glad that that experience turned into something positive for you, Jared. And you're absolutely right. You know, it, it, it's it's not uncommon. Um, in fact, like what you said, it could be heard, you know, someone who's close to you, someone you love the most would yeah. tell something like that. And they, they are, they're coming from a place of, yeah, they, they have the best intention. But for someone who is on the receiving end, it's like a make or break, you know? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm really glad that you turned the other way um, and yeah. not totally sure. and not make well, it. And I was very lucky to be buoyed by people much, uh, just wonderful people who loved me and loved that I was pursuing this thing that I loved. And so my wife is a constant support and would pick up a pencil that I threw across the room <laughs> and say, no, you love this thing. Like, don't, you know, don't, don't let this kind of, don't, don't get uh, upset over this kind of thing. And uh, friends along the way and mentors along the way, you know, uh, who've really helped me. I think that's that's really important to be surrounded by people who will be your cheerleaders, supporters, and mentors. Um, I think I've listened to one other podcast talk about how you should be surrounded by five people. I can't remember the others, but definitely cheerleader, supporter, um, are one of those. So I'm glad that you have sure. those people in your life. Um, let's talk about how you ventured into watercolor. So you, you did mention earlier that you started you started graphic design. Is is that right? Mm-hmm. For yes. And then for work. Um, it's also graphic design. Yeah. Doing. Um, but there's this feeling inside that you really want to draw. So you kept on drawing, but it's this books, the comic books, right? Which sort of kick started everything for you. Yeah. Graphic novels. Yeah. Graphic in novels. particular, I've never really been, uh, particularly interested in comic books, like, mm-hmm. uh, grow, you know, growing up, uh, and then getting into it. It was, to me, it was more graphic novels and stuff that wasn't necessarily superhero related. So that was the kind of thing that sparked, like I had no idea that was possible <laughs> that you yeah. could tell a story that wasn't, you know, was, yeah. a superhero. <laughs> exactly. Which, which um, I think you, you also shared about you've, that it's like a fish in the sea, that it all made sense for you. And that's sort of yeah. like a moment for you. I, I would say that I would think that that was a turning point for you to you to really pursue. And um, your best friend who gave you the watercolor palette. I, I'm, I, this is funny because I've been having artists here on the show who talked about someone giving them a palette. And that's sort mm-hmm. of like started the whole thing. And wow. Sure. Who is it? Those people, right? Who yeah, saw the yeah. potential in you, who's willing to support you and cheer you on to for you to pursue something that in your heart you're really passionate about. Yeah. So talk about watercolor. You, I, I know right now when we were talking offline that you're very much interested in plein air and you've done mm-hmm. exhibitions for it as well when, when you went to New York, and we'll touch on touch on that in just a bit. But when you started with watercolor. First off, why watercolor? Sure. Why not other media? Like I know you mentioned about the fascination with ink earlier. Sure, so, yeah. I had in, I had initially really liked uh inked books. So mm-hmm. the best friend Kelly I was talking about gave me a copy of this book called um Blankets, and it is all ink drawings. And so I had thought that was really cool. Just the black and white inks and how powerful you could make um, art using just black and white. And so I had been interested in pursuing that um, until I started discovering these, these French artists who were using watercolor. And so um, then I just got really into it. And so I started using it and I really liked uh, the effects you could get with it. And I think also the, just the portability of it, just because Mm -hmm. I could like for the lunch break at the graphic design job, I had like a little palette set up. So when it was like the second it hit noon, I could pull the drawer out and I could do small studies with watercolor very quickly where you can't necessarily do that with oil or something where you have to, it's like a big major cleanup involved. Doing all during lunch breaks. (laughs) 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 They, uh, and, and so I started doing these little studies with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I wanted to get better. And I, and I think I had um, been interested in this artist, Cyril Pedroza. And I read this book, um, Portugal by him, and it totally 
uh, opened my eyes. I, he was using color as a storytelling tool, which I had never considered possible. So the colors of the scene, the lighting of the scene matched the sort of mood of the scene. And what I loved about the book is he's a French artist. And the book I had got now, it's, you can get it in English. You can get a, most of his books in English now. At the time, though, there weren't a whole lot of his books over here uh, in the U.S. And Portugal had been brought over by this uh one publisher, I can't remember who did it, but it was still in French. It was just the French copy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got the French book, but what what totally changed my perspective was that I was able to read it cover to cover and uh, without knowing what the word bubbles were saying. I could tell by the expressions. I could tell by the posture. I could tell by the lighting of the scene, which and how much the lighting of these of the scene affected, you know, there if there was like a tense or sad moment between the characters, maybe it was raining or they were spotlit by something. There was always some sort of lighting effect that supported the story. So without actually reading words, I could fluently connect to this story. It was like this thing like this thing sort of happened where I felt like I was connected to this collective conscious of experience and reading it because I didn't need to know what the words were. And this, I mean, this was before we had Google translate and you could just hold up your phone. Right. So I didn't even have to like translate it. I knew what they were saying and I knew what was happening. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, and I felt so connected to that. So I, I, uh, at that point I became sort of obsessed with um i i at the time up to that point i had started doing comic strips so i was doing these little strips that were auto bio strips and just sort of like a day in the life kind of thing like i woke up i got coffee i whatever you know <laughs> and um and they were fine and it was a good exercise in deadline and having something to draw mm -hmm. and so i was doing these constantly and uh after i read zero pedroza's book it was like it changed everything for me. And I was like, I have to, I have to do this thing, whatever he's doing. I want to know how he did it. I have to f solve this equation because, uh, I felt so connected to that story. So I sort of left trying to do comics and I got really involved in technical pursuit of getting better at drawing. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to necessarily, um, you know, imply that that is somehow good or better to get technically better it is just a like i see it as just sort of a muscle so because i know that's something that always i get kind of sad about is if I do, when i teach workshops and that's usually the, the main thing people get so mad at themselves about or they stop their sketch early because they say oh, i'm terrible or i'm not very good or this isn't very good but it's i always feel like i have to sit down with people and say like this is it's just a muscle that you could increase if you wanted to and you could someday increase you have to like in order to continue to grow, you need clean fuel in the tank. And so you really have to learn how to love the process without getting upset over things like technical skill, which is really not important, really. I mean, um, when it comes to just being passionate about making art, but what I, for what I wanted to do, I wanted to get better. And so I wanted to take some time to focus on um, growing those muscles. And so I got very involved in subscription schools, which I wish Etcher was around at the time when they were and doing theirs. But at the time it was just new masters Academy and schoolism and a couple other little ones. And so I got very involved in those and just started doing like the bark plates and just charcoal drawing, just figure drawing. And I was got very involved in the local figure drawing um, group twice a week. And I started doing uh, which that sort of fed into plain air painting. But um, all of that sort of was out of wanting to increase my technical skill mm -hmm. and also figure out how he was able to use light as the storytelling tool. And that led me down the path of like, well, who did watercolor and what did it look like? And so I got into Winslow Homer and Andrew Wyeth and these um, artistic greats from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And then even before that, and like Norwich school painters and Constable and Turner and um, English painters and uh, who were doing watercolor. And I noticed, I started to see this sort of, you know, I was kind of going crazy. I was started to become obsessed with how I was like, Oh, I'm starting to get these, this through line of composition and how this affects this and how, uh, sh you know, shape psychology and this kind of thing and how they're 
using this, whether intuitively or not, some of the, you know, or, or choosing to use this particular shape of composition or shape of design to uh, tell a story better. And, um, and I started to feel that kind of connection I felt to that book with these paintings from the late 1800s. And so uh, that's sort of how that sort of they started weaving back and forth. And then plein air painting just became my sort of safe haven because when I started actually working in comics, when you start selling you know, work, whether you're selling paintings or, or working as an illustrator, it sort of changes your relationship to it. Um, and, and I, you can very quickly burn out and, and it becomes difficult when it becomes a job, um, because it becomes a job and it feels like a job. Most days I have like, sometimes I'll have, I had one student one time tell me that she was sad that her son was, uh, her son became a, a butcher. He loved to draw, but he quit and became a butcher. And she was like, I wish he would have pursued drawing because mm -hmm. now he's just, now he's just like slicing ham all day. And I was like, well, in my, and I told her, I was like, I honestly, like, I'm happy to be doing this plein air workshop, but like, I, I feel like I, there's no difference between slicing ham and what I do when I'm drawing <laughs> comics, because there are a lot of days where I'm tired and exhausted, but I have to get up and get it in here and sit down and draw. And I have editors and people who want to change the camera angle and change the lighting or change this and that. And there's a constant sort of, um, feedback and commentary on what I'm doing and, um, a constant list of changes and adjustments where I feel like what plein air painting became and figure painting became, uh, for me was like this safe haven where no one can touch this thing. Yeah. And, I don't necessarily, I, I've been fortunate enough to sell some paintings and have them in shows and things, which is just a fortunate sort of byproduct, but I don't, it's not something I pursue actively mm -hmm. uh, because plein air painting to me is like, no, no one can touch this thing. It's my thing. And I'll draw with pink fuchsia, hot pink, or, you know, neon blue, or maybe I'll draw with a highlighter, use half watercolor, half gouache or something, or pick up some dirt off the ground and scrub it in for texture or something. It doesn't matter because it's my thing. And, and I don't have anybody breathing over my neck telling me that they want changes to it. You know, it's my kind of safe, safe place. And so I think it's good for people to find that you know, whatever that is for you, whether it's art history or studying books from the library, which was also another thing that I'm really passionate about, um, painters. And, um, I, I, it's good to find that clean fuel, uh, because, you know, it, it, eventually everything that you do when you, especially if you start selling it or exchanging money for it in some way, um, becomes just work, you know? And so it's important to have a, a place that you can sort of grow on your own and experiment and, and try things out and, uh, and not worry about whether or not it sells or something or is marketable, you know? There were several things that I picked up with what you just shared. Um, Jared, first off was continuous study and that, really inkling to learn more and to improve your craft. I love how you study um, and continuously improving, especially art history. Not a lot, I, I'm not sure for, for most artists, right? Because normally what they would really uh, spend more time on is how to improve their techniques. But I don't hear a lot of artists dabble into learning about art history. With you, it, it made total sense because you started to see the differences. The shape, you mentioned about the shapes, how the use of light in order to tell stories. And especially mm -hmm. that um, the story that you shared when, when you were reading this graphic novels, and it's from a French artist, you don't understand what's in the thought bubble, but then you manage to pick up on what the, the, what the story is about. And it's just because of the painting, the drawing. So how important storytelling is i mean how important are the the paintings or the drawings when it comes to conveying a story to your audience just whoever who will um, will see the the art piece or the book itself how sure is it? or, yeah what's what's the question i'm sorry how important is 
the painting to the oh to the story oh, storytelling yes oh yeah absolutely um it's absolutely crucial <laughs> uh to me and and in my process and and because it's so much of what i'm passionate about mm -hmm. i think um some examples i think of and uh, you know people listening can either google it or they probably already know it if they took any kind of art history class but if you look at people like jean leon jerome mm -hmm. who was one of the heads of the echol in the late 1800s and he some of his paintings for example like there's this painting called the gladiator and the way he has the most of it is in shadow but the light just the dappled light from the coliseum is all pointing at this main gladiator character and the difference in posture of the people in the crowd versus the gladiator himself, who is in this sort of Superman pose, like posture, his chest is out. He looks very heroic to the men on the ground who are kind of, uh, you know, wounded and, and laying down. And you can read the story, you know, it's like this triumphant mm -hmm. music plays in your head when you look at it, you just feel the sense of what's going on there. Um, and there's another painting, I think it's called a duel or something, but it's like this snowy scene and just the mm -hmm. posture of the characters, you can see, the one character is wounded and held up by like being held up by his friends and he looks mortally wounded and they, everyone looks terribly sad. And the painting is very drab lighting. It's very sort of, it's snowy, but it's foggy and it's kind of like, it looks rainy in a sense. So, it, and the hero, so to speak, the one who has obviously won this duel is sort of hunkered down and, and walking away from the scene. So you get the sense just by looking at the painting. I mean, I could do this, literally for weeks just talking about individual paintings so i'll try to just keep it concise but you can tell that the hero is not necessarily proud of of the victory it's not it's the opposite it's you can get this sense of feeling like uh maybe this was something he didn't want to do you know and you get that in his posture the way he's walking away from the scene and um the overall lighting and atmosphere and so i say that to say um John Leon Jerome was sort of my avenue into this idea. He was doing these huge um, uh, paintings that were, te they would tell a story and um, they were all very highly realistic, beautifully rendered paintings. He was a figure teacher at the Echo, uh, which was like the, the big premier art school in the late 1800s in France. And um, he was, absolutely fantastic at what he did and so that's the kind of thing i'm talking about that through line i found between that and then and in the modern storytelling and in what i was seeing in cyril pedroza's work so to me um it's like so stephen king wrote this book on writing called on writing <laughs> and um it's a fantastic book um and i read it because i'm interested in in getting better at writing and that's another muscle. And one thing he says uh, in the book is that when you're writing, all of these little things that you have are like tools in a toolbox. Like you carry around this toolbox everywhere you go. And so I think, I think it's the same with telling a story, whether you're doing a plein air painting or you're trying to do an illustration or you're just, uh, or, or doing like what I do with the comics is all these little things that you have. It's like your toolbox. And so for him in the book, he's describing like, sentence structure mm -hmm. uh you know uh spelling of course and like mm -hmm. you know the knowledge of story and the knowledge of the history of story and all these little things are individual tools you would use because every story is kind of like a problem and you're trying to solve that problem in the same way you might try to fix like you know like fix a sink or something and so you go to your toolbox to find the tools to fix that problem. And so when I'm developing as, uh, uh, a person who makes art, I tend to think of story and these paintings as they're all like a, it's like a problem that you're trying to solve. And I have all these various tools in my toolbox, which is, you know, if it's an illustration, I have like lighting is one tool that I can use. I can choose to use to try to, you know, uh, tell the story better or, drafting, you know, or, you know, drawing skill, that kind of thing is another tool you can improve. And there are all of these tools are sort of like individual muscles. And as you increase one muscle, it's sort of like the tide rises all the ships. So mm -hmm. you 
you can take time to develop something specific. Like if you, if someone is worried about their drawing, not being great, because most of it is drawing, whether you're painting or using a pencil, it's all essentially drawing. Uh, just depends on how you're looking at it, whether it's contour or masses and shapes and that sort of thing. So if you're wanting to develop that, you can develop that muscle. So it's all like, if you're trying to do something like a graphic novel or a large illustration, or even a larger plein air or finished studio painting, it's sort of like a marathon. Um, and you can take time, you know, if you're going to do a marathon, you would spend time developing muscles and it's not necessarily just walking on a treadmill for a while or running on a treadmill for a while people have to develop muscles you know diet food whatever it's like all part of these things in your kit and your toolbox that help to get you across the finish line and it's kind of the same i think with um telling a story in art is that we have these various tools and the thing that's wonderful about our history Sorry, I'm trying to be concise. I'm terrible at it. Uh, oh, but <laughs> <laughs> the thing that's great about our, our history is that the it, it's all there. They it, it's been done for you. It's kind of like when you're studying math and you can look at the back and all the answers yes. are there. And <laughs> it, when you're looking at like Winslow Homer, like if you want to develop your watercolor skill, if you look at someone like Winslow Homer, John Singer Sargent, Andrew Wyeth, um, mm -hmm. and of course there's modern greats. I'm just referring to people from art history at this point, yeah. but um, when you're looking at great artists, the, the equation is there. And if you study what they did, you can develop an understanding mm -hmm. of, okay, they're using this shape here. You know, Winslow Homer, he'll do a lot of like, a lot of like dull greens in the background, kind of low saturated colors. And then we'll have some guy in a canoe who's like straight from the tube, bright red, you know? And it's like, wow, why does this guy in the boat pop so much? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. he's obviously, you know, you start to develop this understanding. Okay. So he's decreasing the saturation of these colors is making the background feel way far back. And mm -hmm. that's aerial perspective. And he's got um, heightened saturation and intensity on this guy in the boat. He's got heightened contrast values, you know? And so if you study both modern and from art history masters, you, you can sort of study the equations in the same way you would, uh, if I knew more about math, it would be a better metaphor, uh, p p uh the Pythagorean theory or a uh, theorem or whatever. It's like, it's the equation is there. You can learn these things and, and how they arrange, um, their, their shapes, their ideas, and, um, you know, how they're using value and color and contrast. And they're all those individual muscles, those individual tools in your toolkit, and you develop and strengthen them. And then when you go to do your own plein air painting or, or urban sketch or whatever, mm -hmm. you can bring all these tools to the problem and you can use a, a very sort of heightened sense of say, like the understanding of the science of light, uh, things like that with, uh, you even, you know, so that your sketches on a small scale to a larger finished studio painting will, um, ha come with that heightened awareness of, uh, of storytelling. And so to me, to answer the question <laughs> 10 <laughs> minutes later, uh, it's, uh, it's all about developing those muscles and developing those tools for the toolkit. And the problem is, I want to tell this story. I want to connect, I guess, is really this, this situation. I want to get in touch with this sort of uh, collective consciousness, if you will, of people's shared experience. We've all had rejection. We've all had pain. We've all maybe gotten our heart broken, uh, or we've all also been jealous or we've been, uh, terrible to someone in our life incidentally and we've all had these shared experiences whether we're the hero or the villain and uh and there is this kind of moment this connection there where you can tap into that and there's this really beautiful connection with people where you can sort of share in this thing say we are all this we are all we all have this no matter where you come from uh you know, we have felt this pain before, or we have felt this jealousy or love or happiness or whatever, and we can share that moment. So that's my problem is how do I touch that moment? How do I kind of tap into that collective consciousness? And so to me, I come with my toolbox and in my case is watercolor and gouache. And, um, and I hopefully can communicate an idea and a story that people will connect with and see themselves in and, um, share an experience.
beautifully said and thank you for giving me a crash course about <laughs> history that was just so i'm so glad i didn't put you to sleep no, i no, always I, feel I, like i, I need to cool I, it <laughs> in my head i'm like I'm if i start going down art history <laughs> You're talking to the right person because I am a museum dweller. That's why I, that's what I refer to myself. So I love visiting museums, reading through uh, sure, sure. for hours and just yeah, studying me too. works. And I, I just love museums. And for other people, that might be a boring um, way of spending sure. time. But for me, I learned so much from, from looking at paintings. And for you studying sure, me too. Um, works of like the crates from the 1800s, I love how you talk about the toolkit because it's absolutely true whether it's storytelling through painting or like storytelling person storytelling in itself and you talk about shared experiences shared experience i believe that we are all connected with stories and it's the reason sure. when you talk to someone and you have a similar shared experience that you know yeah. resonates with you and mm -hmm. able to translate that um for me when we talk about art in itself, art for me is it's life, right? You mm -hmm. you wrote something and then someone looked at it and that person felt as if looking at the painting that he was seen or heard through the sure. colors, through the light, the contrast, the shapes, or the story that the, the art piece is tr is trying to convey to its audience. And I love that that you focus on that, that you create. Uh, with that focus in mind, um, Jared, because more than ever, that's exactly what we need to be. I mean, everyone wants to feel heard and seen and for people to understand the pain and everything that you have gone through. And for, for someone to create something that will allow that person to feel that he's being seen and heard. I think that's, that is a liberating feeling at the same time, um, comforting to be able to find an avenue where you are allowed to uh, acknowledge your emotions, revisit them. And what's more amazing, it's, it's through a piece of art created by someone, a total stranger. Sure. Um, sure. You talk about the toolkit. And for a lot of people who's starting to study art or starting in their art or creative journey, what would be your piece of advice um, as, as to what to focus on? I ask this because you've dabbled into different mediums, uh, different facets of art, techniques, but you finally found your niche and something that you've, you're really passionate about. But you also did talk about something that you do for work and then creating something or doing something that you just love doing because mm -hmm. You just love doing it. Yeah. But for someone who's starting out, um, what would be your piece of advice, Jared? Because you talk about the toolkit and the importance of it, building muscles for every part of that toolkit. Um, what would be your main advice as to what to focus on first? Sure. Um, I think it, uh, one thing I think it's hard to really put into words the the mm -hmm. skill to develop but there is a skill in developing a uh, a practice mm -hmm. which is to say being able to abandon attachment to the individual drawings that you do or the individual paintings mm -hmm. and be able to um i think in the beginning in particular it has much more to do with quantity than the specific quality of what you're doing okay. and so i think uh from my own experience and my whole goal with teaching, I have like a YouTube channel that teaches traditional painting and my whole goal and passion there is because I'd love to shave some time off of somebody else's journey that I spent just beating my head against the wall, trying to get better at painting. Mm -hmm. And, um, because I think one of the things I learned was that you, you really have to, uh, learn how to, um, shield yourself in a sense from criticism and usually the worst comes from yourself so figuring out a way that you can develop a passion for part of the process understanding why you are doing it and what you like about it and really pursuing it and i think if you're going to start somewhere i personally would say probably one of the best things to do is develop your drawing so take some time you don't have to spend the rest of your life doing it mm -hmm. although i'm I don't know how many years into this over 10 years and I'm still practicing and doing this, but is um, just to give a specific practical exercise, I think 
when I was starting out drawing, I had a, a guy who was a mentor. Uh, he was a teacher at a, at a school in illustration. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about is um, he was advising me. So I told him, I just called him one day and was like, listen, I, I think I want to draw and I want to get better. What's your suggestion? He said, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Follow exactly what I tell you to do and you'll get better at drawing. You know, it doesn't necessarily make you a better artist, but it is, if you're wanting to develop that skill of just happen to draw better, here's your exercise. And he told me, get a sketchbook that no one will ever see, uh, a secret sketchbook, you know, spouse, whoever, no one sees it. It's only for you and get yourself a pen and preferably either a fountain pen, although they're sort of a pain or a, uh, like a rollerball pen, like a, a V five, the pilot pens or whatever that are just like fluid ink that just shoots out is the key is a pen that if you stop, it's going to make a mess. So, and draw every single thing you see every single thing with no concept of how it's arranged or what you're drawing, just draw everything you see from life. And so draw the cat and draw the dishes in the sink and draw the cup on the counter and then the coffee maker and then the counter and then the oven and just everywhere you go, 360 degrees, draw everything you see and don't show anybody. And it teaches you what I, I did it for. And I still do it. I go back to that exercise often and just fill a sketchbook just for fun. Just, just fill it. And the goal at that time was just fill sketchbooks quantity over quality no one's going to see these only for your eyes and just draw everything you see so what you become uh you start to develop more of a relationship between your eyes and your muscles mm -hmm. and how you're drawing things and how what you're seeing translates to the page but you're also more importantly learning how to just keep going so when you're drawing with a pen, you're inevitably not going to do a, you're not going to print things out. There are very few people, though they do exist, who can just like print reality on the page. Uh, and I certainly wasn't one of them and am not. Um, but you, you're, you're, it's going to be wonky. It's going to be a little strange. You're going to develop the, a lot of your toolkits in doing that exercise, because you're going to develop the abandonment of attachment to the individual drawing. Just turn the page, keep going mm -hmm. is a important skill to keep, to, to develop. And as you are growing and you're also developing your technical skill, occasionally you'll draw a cup and you'll nail it and it'll just happen to look right. A lot of times you'll end up with a very wonky looking cup that for some reason looks more right than a technically accurate drawn mm -hmm. cup. And that's another lesson. It, sometimes it's not the technical accuracy that really sells a scene. And so you don't know what context people are going to bring to a painting or a drawing. Like you said, what kind of experiences they bring, they yeah. see a bridge and maybe they see where they propose to their spouse, or maybe they see where they got rejected or dumped. You know, you don't know what context people bring to a painting when they see it and what kind of experience they're going to have. Yeah. So, um, but in the beginning, it's important to develop drawing skills because then when you get into things like painting, it's all still drawing. It's always, you're always drawing. It's just a matter of whether you're using paint or a pencil. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to use that. No eraser, just a pen and fill as many sketchbooks as you can. Um, because at it, you're not going to hurt anything by getting better at drawing technically i think the the pit fall though the, the hole you can fall into is getting into the notion that that is somehow more important or the only important thing um because i've taught a lot of workshops and i've run into a lot of people who just beat themselves up and i spent years beating myself up and telling my wife that i was terrible i'm never going to make it i'm awful and blah 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 and i was fortunate enough to have my wife who could just tell me stop. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fine. You're, you know, and, but not everybody has that or at this moment in their practice. So you've got to develop, um, a steely sense of why you're doing this thing and what you're pursuing. And that doesn't necessarily have to be something lofty. Like what I said, that's been years and years and years of thinking about it. And then also develop a practice of art of, I think it's important to get in touch with art what's going on in art history. So read Robert Henry's book, Edgar Payne's book on composition, you know, anything you can get your hands on, I think, and libraries are a fantastic resource. Read about their life story, you know, read Edgar Degas's biography, Whistler's biography, whoever, like develop uh, a connection with this art history, because there's 
there's a story in all of it and you can see it in their paintings and you can sort of see how it's reflected in their experience. And I think you could in mind too, in a sense that, you know, I, I don't know if you've read my kids, my book, Cody, but just to talk about the story, it's like story is this weird anomaly, um, that does pop up randomly. It's like people have dreams Mm -hmm. that are some weird, small religious mythology from some tribe on the other end of the world that they have no way of connecting or talking to that person in any way. There's this weird collective consciousness that's, that happens with stories. And so I know, like for me with the book, I did Cody, what I told you when you asked me my art history, my, or my history with making art, that is the book of Cody. It's just all underneath the sort of metaphor of this girl who meets this bear and which was supposed to be sort of representative of the art spirit. And then they lose connection and she Mm -hmm. she goes off to the city and then it's this bear's pursuit to find her again. And, and to me, that was my journey as a person who makes art. And so I think, um, uh, yeah, so I think that that's probably on a practical sense is, is, for, for people developing as, um, an artist is you can develop your skills. And then of course there's also just, but, uh, Oh, I guess the, the main through line I would say, other than steal yourself is develop a, uh, good clean fuel. So whether that's art history or, or the books, but you, you have to have some kind of clean fuel. So, um, so I think for me, plein air painting and figure painting became a way that I could just sort of, um, pursue it in a, low threshold of, you know, danger of, of rejection or pain and just pursue what I wanted to do. And, and I think this is sort of obvious, but pursue it with everything you've got, you know, like really find the thing you're passionate about and pursue it with everything you've got. Like, it's like Alice in Wonderland. It's like, you have to go down the rabbit hole and then wherever that takes you, you know, when I got into it, I had no, I always thought painting was stuffy and sort of boring Mm -hmm. and too art schooly and highfalutin. Like this is for people who are like, you know, artsy quote unquote, (laughs) I'm not an artsy person. I want to do this thing because I am not an artsy person. And I still sort of feel that way that I, I sometimes say, because I feel like I go to plein air events or things and I feel a a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I come from cartoon drawing that I feel like I'm not an artist as a capital a is what I always tell my wife (laughs) that I, I always makes me nervous to paint with painters because I'm like, well, there, of course, they are an artist with a capital a, they, whatever, you know, and, and I'm, somehow less than the imposter syndrome kicks in right and it's that's not healthy but um i'm just you know to be honest that's how i feel a lot of times but you you i got to painting through just 100 chasing this thing so i think you go through it and you may try oil painting or you may try something but i think really try it try it and and um and because, you know, if you do get better at watercolor and you don't do watercolor, it's going to make your drawings better and it's going to make your other stuff better. It's like the tide that rises all the ships. Mm-hmm. If you pursue oil and you get better at oil, you're going to make your watercolor better because it's going to change your perspective, having to think of things more opaquely. And mm-hmm. Same with uh, drawing with ink. If you're drawing with ink or charcoal, you're mm-hmm. just sort of, you're going to get better at all these things. It's hard to settle into the process and enjoy the process, but um but you, you will get better if you do it. It's, it is a skill you can learn like scales on piano, you know? Yes. Agree. I, I, I love the, the points that you shared of, um, for someone who is starting out, especially the sketchbook. I think I've heard that in, in one of the interviews as well, keeping something that you don't really have to show it to anyone and how yeah. to criticize it or, you know, sure. analyze, but it's something that you can use for practice and just keep it in your drawer. But the important thing there is like what you said is to practice consistently. Yeah. And give it with all you have uh, with, with what you've got. Yeah, right. I, you say pursue your passion and I want to talk that with um or add that you should carry on with your passion as well because that's what i've seen in your journey um jared despite the no's that you mm-hmm. that you have gotten from when you were 16 when you were um sharing your manuscript your, your book and you're getting rejections was just reminded of jk rowling and how many re- rejections she had that sure you, you know look at it's part of the process yeah yes but 
It, I love that how vulnerable you are when you were sharing that because not a lot of people, when, when someone look at someone, you winning an award, you have a published book, um, having, you know, exhibitions and um, galleries wanted to exhibit your works, people might look at you and say, you know, this is really a good artist, you know, and, but underneath all that, what you see on social is a story. And this is what I love about your journey because, it, it, it has peaks and valleys, but what's consistent in, in those peaks and valleys is that you remain persistent and you remain um, clear with what you want to achieve despite the hurdles in between. Um, mm-hmm. Jared, you had a class with us as well, with Etcher, and we talked about the toolkit earlier. And one other thing that you all, you also do it are portraits. And mm-hmm. the, the mini workshop, for the live demo and the mini workshop, that's what you shared with, with our audience and with our students. Can you share a little bit more about that? Because I know you talked about light and how important it is when you are creating sure. portraits, but can you share a little bit more about the class? By the way, that class happened March of this year, March 11 to be exact. So that recording is still available on the web on the website. If you love and you learned a lot from this interview that I have with, with Jared, I'm sure you're going to pick up on a lot of things that will benefit you in your art journey through the recording. So do check it out. Jared, can you share a little bit more about the, the work? Sure. Um, I did uh, uh, a short kind of class on watercolor portrait painting, mm-hmm. and um, I love painting portraits, and I love figure painting as well. And I think the, what got me into those things was kind of back to that sort of idea of building muscles and getting stronger at things if you're interested in that sort of thing which is again not the most important thing in the world but if you're interested at improving your skill as a as a artist then i think portrait painting figure painting are your best avenues that is the difference between sort of walking on the treadmill and using resistance weights so to speak because it's so much harder than say like landscape um because and this is i've heard it said in a number of other classes so i'm quoting someone and saying this it's not my original idea but i can't remember who said it first Mm -hmm. but um if you paint a tree in the distance slightly too high it's not a big deal but if you paint like their one finger too long or if you paint the nose too low all of a sudden they look entirely alien it's like a completely you know it's 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 extremely difficult Mm -hmm. and likeness itself is extremely difficult just just learning the head structure is hard enough and then to add on to that figuring out the likeness and it's this whole difficult kind of interplay with the way you're constantly sort of comparing and measuring and there's parts of likeness that go into how we sort of see things in a caricature in our periphery. There's like all these different elements that go into portrait painting and figure painting that to me, it became something that I really wanted to chase and pursue because I was like, well, if I can get better at that, I can get better at the other stuff because it's all essentially the same when you're doing landscape painting, I try to always try to think of things in just the most basic shape, shoe boxes and, and spheres and cones and that kind of thing. And then when it comes to portrait painting, uh, it has to be more technically precise. And so yeah. that's what got me into portrait painting. And that's what got me or portrait sketching, I should say, mm-hmm. which is just uh, developing a practice of uh, sketching small watercolor portraits. And I learned a lot from James Gurney, who is a regular portrait you know does small portrait painting and um i had always thought that was a fascinating uh, skill and so for me um that was something i wanted was de- when i was developing and, and wanting to get into portrait painting was studying loomis method and all the various methods the riley method and how to build the structure of a portrait and then how to uh constantly measure and compare and then how to communicate lighting difference which is another big part of and this is what the class ended up being more about too which is uh material differences which is something that fascinates me in painting which is like how do we paint and communicate the difference between something that's matte and shiny so i do i do a lot of like in my own practice i do a lot of found still life is what i call it found life sketches which are like Mm -hmm. still life sketches of just random 
objects. Mm -hmm. um, and I particularly like to focus on stuff in the kitchen because mm -hmm. it's a, it's such an array of different materials. If yeah. there's a, like a flower, how do you communicate how light is passing through the petals? If there's like a mixer or mixing cups, they're shiny metal. Like how do you communicate this difference? What is the light doing that's causing you to see a difference? And portraits are a similar thing because it's developing an understanding of the saturation of color and how you can communicate the difference between flesh versus hair versus like, you know, clothing material, shirts or whatever else versus whatever objects are around the person. Um, that is a fascinating thing to me. And that's something that we covered a lot in the class. So mixing and, um, what, what kind of, you know, things we need to pursue in terms of saturation to make it feel like actual flesh versus you know, a zombie or a plastic person, you know? I would love to watch that class because I, I've tried portraits before and I think I've mentioned this several times on the podcast, but it's really challenging and it can be it very is. intimidating. But I'm just looking at um, I'm hearing you talk about what they will be learning for those who haven't watched the recording yet and the takeaways from, from that class. You made it sound that anyone can draw. Um, portraits, um, especially the aspects of light and shadow and how important it is. Um, mm -hmm. because I, I just want to reference it again with the token that you mentioned earlier when you're talking about storytelling, um, the form of um, art. And with portraits, right, when you look at someone's face, there's so many things that you can get out of a single portrait. And the sure. light and shadow can definitely affect how you would want to perceive what the emotions yeah, um, absolutely. of that person uh, who's, who's in the portrait. So if you are interested to learn more about that, then go ahead and check out the recording. Again, it's on the Etcher Studio website. So do check out the recording. Um, Jared, it's been a pleasure having you on. I learned so much and I love <laughs> from someone who's very passionate about art history. Call me biased, but I'm also I'm also very awesome. fascinated with that. I, I love um, looking at um, works from from like the, the artists from the eighth sure. century and um, especially the storytelling part. Um, I think it's, sure. it's one thing that maybe uh, sometimes overlooked, but it's a, a very important factor and element uh, when when you are creating something, whether it's art or song or uh, a piece of writing or an article. It's the storytelling holds everything together. And sure, you talk about um, that. There's a problem. So it's the conflict. If you if you want to have compare it with um, like stories, it's it's the conflict. What is that you're trying to resolve? So mm -hmm. looking at those elements that you talked about within the toolkit, um, it, it gives me a bigger perspective of how important um, art is and the elements that you put in there in order to create a story that would resonate with the audience or whoever is looking to, um, yeah. to the painting. So Jared, thank you so much for sharing your insights, your journey with us. It's so inspiring. And any other um, golden nuggets that you want to leave our audience before we wrap up the show? Sure. Well, the first, thank you so much for having me on and um, everything that Etcher is doing. You guys are doing such cool stuff with this between the subscription school and the, um, you know, all the, you know, products and stuff that they're producing. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's really an honor to do it. I love the podcast. And um, I think if people are wanting to get into art history, by the way, a good blanket uh, book to get into and get really excited about it is if you can track down and I, I listen to, I own the book and I have bought the book maybe seven times. Cause every time I talk to someone and they say, I haven't read it, I just give them my copy and buy another one. But if you, my library has it on audiobook for free. So if your library may have it, uh, you could listen to it, but it's a book called, uh, the judgment of Paris. And, um, it's, um, let me get the author's name, right? Ross. It's, uh, Ross King is the author. And, um, so Ross King's The Judgment of Paris is, uh, I think, my favorite book. It's, um, it's very dense, and it is a dual biography through a very tumultuous time in art history. And it's of Manet, Edouard Manet, and Maisonnier. 
and how they are kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum okay. uh, in that Manet was the young and the new and the fresh in 1860. And Maisonnier was like the old guard. He's like a very technical, precise. He did the famous painting of Napoleon and Friedland and, um, and Manet was being more experimental. He was like the sort of, you know, jazz or the punk rock or whatever of that era of 1860. And so it's the their two simultaneous biographies and then how they overlapped like everybody of that era. So it's like you're following their through line through Pissarro and Bert Morisot and all these other super famous art art uh figures monet and uh it's basically it's the story of impressionism it's the story of what happened to paris the siege of paris between 1860 and like i think maybe 1910 i forget what the, where the book ends but um mm -hmm. it is fantastic so it's like many biographies of every all the greats of that era and then like just what was happening with art. So that's a great one um, for people to pursue. If you're looking for a book to just get excited about art history and sort of dip your toe in it. Uh, and then of course the art that. spirit. Yeah. Show links, uh, show notes rather. Oh, sure. Awesome. Very yeah. cool. And uh, uh, Robert Henry's book, The Art Spirit is another great one to uh, to read, to track down as soon as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll definitely check that out, Jared. Sure. Thank you so much for the book recommendations. Again, um, it's been a pleasure it's been really a pleasure having you on the show I, like what i said i learned so much and i look forward i would probably check out your book um cody cool. there's two cody. right cody one and cody two i'm currently working on the sequel cody two oh, right now oh, so okay. that just got okay a green light and the story is done and i just have to draw it now and then paint okay. it yeah, we'll, we'll so. definitely check it out. Um, thank you again, uh, Jared. Thanks so much. For, for being on the show. And we look forward to seeing more of your works and what you're going to be up to next. Um, the book too, or many other books. Maybe you can write something about hard history too. No, I'm, I've, it's crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea, but I have, I, yeah, yeah, I've got to finish everything else on the plate first. So definitely hold on to that idea. I think you'll be great at it. <laughs> Thanks Thank very you, much. Jared. Stay safe and Thanks. I'll have you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stories open doors of connection. It is a powerful tool that enables us to build trust and the opportunity to use our experiences to help out others in their journey. Storytelling through art might be a new concept for others, but here's an activity that I'd like for you to do. Draw or paint something. Share your work with someone and ask them how it made them feel. What stories can they create in their head by looking at your work? I'm sure you will receive interesting answers. So do share with us your experience by leaving a comment through the blog post associated with this podcast at etrolab.com slash Jared. So until then, let's make more art.